Hey everyone, what is up? Pop Daddy here. And on today's episode, we're going to be looking for a truth. A truth that is buried in myth. And a myth that I think some people would like to think is true, but might not be true. Our story begins in 2015. And thanks to a tweet that brought this up in 2021, it appears at one point every year. It states that during the filming of Mrs. Doubtfire, Robin Williams ad-libbed so much that there is a PG, a PG-13, an R, and an NC-17 version of the movie. Four different cuts, according to an interview with director Chris Columbus with Yahoo Entertainment. Today we're going to find out how true this is. And to find out how true this is, we need a map. And this map is in two pieces. And the first piece is Robin Williams. If you were fortunate enough to grow up in the 80s and 90s, you should have fond memories of him. If you grew up after, his family-friendly fare was probably a staple in your household. If you were an adult at the time, you probably would have seen him through stand-up, his sitcom Mork and Mindy, and a string of successful TV appearances and movies such as The World According to Garp, Moscow on the Hudson, and Cadillac Man. At his heart, he was a force of pure comedy and a master of improvisation. Some people loved him, some people hated him, uh, some people thought he was too much, others thought he was just right. But one thing is for sure, when he was on, he was unstoppable, and you were in for a ride. And it just didn't stop at comedy. Although he previously dabbled in drama throughout the 80s and 90s, he proved he wasn't just a comedic actor. After being nominated three previous times, he finally won an Academy Award in 1998 for Goodwill Hunting. He pushed himself even further with new characters, some tragic, some creepy, some dangerous, and some that were outright jerks. But his career in Family Friendly Fair started to get big in 1980 when he landed the title role in the live-action adaptation of Popeye. He became even bigger with families in 1991 when he starred as a grown-up Peter Pan in Steven Spielberg's Hook. But in 1992, if kids didn't know him by then, they would. Walt Disney Pictures released an animated version of the story of Aladdin and cast Williams as the genie. And they let the genie out of the bottle, literally. They let Robin do his thing with Adelman and impersonations, which is why we got Arnold Schwarzenegger and Arsenio Hall in 2500 era BC. But it paid off. The genie was a hit with both kids and adults, and it would be a lie to say that the movie's success wasn't attributed to Williams. Here's where our story really begins. The next year, he starred as Daniel Hiller in the movie Mrs. Doubtfire, a story about a man who dresses as an English nanny in order to get visitation with his children. And they consider this to be one of his best or most known roles. Now that's just the first piece. Now unfortunately this isn't a retrospective on Robin Williams and it isn't really a retrospective on Mrs. Doubtfire as a whole. Now here's where the second piece comes in. Since the mid-1930s there's been a loose version of the movie rating system. In 1966 the Motion Picture Association of America or MPAA introduced the more modern version with four film ratings. G for general audiences, M for mature audiences with parental discretion advised, R, restricted to anyone under 16 without a guardian, and X, for nobody under 16 admitted. In 1970, R and X up to the ages to 17, and M turned into GP for all audiences with parental guidance suggested. In 1972, GP was changed to PG, and the rating system stayed this way for over a decade. In 1984, two films pushed the envelope on the PG rating, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Gremlins. Certain scenes were deemed too graphic for the younger audiences that would see PG movies. Director Steven Spielberg suggested that a new rating was in order between PG and R. And on July 1st, 1984, less than a month after Gremlins was released, the PG-13 rating was introduced. A little over a month later, Red Dawn would, would be the first movie to use that rating. By 1990, the X rating was also being used for adult films, so the MPAA introduced the NC-17 rating for no children under 17. The NC-17 rating is also considered the kiss of death for a movie due to limited audience potential. The movie rating system has not changed since. The movies are rated due to everything from language to violence to nudity to drug use. Usually about two to three F-bombs and or anything more than certain brief nudity gets you from PG-13R. In the 80s they would let it slide more, whereas some PG movies had F-bombs and in the late 90s PG-13 Titanic had nudity. Here's where the pieces come together. Now, for Mrs. Doubtfire, he said there were four versions of the film. PG, PG-13, R, and NC-17. For PG, that's 
doing kid gloves. They, they probably just edited some stuff out, let him ad lib, and put it on TV. The only movies I can think of off the top of my head that had made for TV versions are Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Ghostbusters. PG-13, that's the theatrical version, so nothing there. Probably just adjusted the script a little bit. Seeing as for an R rating, about two to three F-bombs gets you from PG-13 to R, I would say it is possible that there is an R-rated version out there. Now, regarding the NC-17 version, according to Chris Columbus, they would do the scene as scripted once or twice. Then he would let Williams do his thing. I'm going to try and see where he would have ad-libbed to have it have been so bad that it not only would have gotten an R rating, but an NC-17 rating. First things first, um, seeing the kind of genuine, kind person he was, I refuse to believe he did any hard ad-libbing in any scenes with the kids, so just get those out of there. Now, seeing as that takes up most of the movie, did he ad-lib in the scenes with kids? Oh, most definitely, but he most likely definitely kept it clean. So taking those scenes out, Here's where I can see him going all in on the ad-libbing. First scene is him doing the voiceover work in the studio. This is a perfect chance for him to start stretching his legs and take off running. But if you remember in the movie, he quits over a dispute with the producers over something that's morally questionable in the scene. So I don't believe that the character would be dropping any F-bombs or using any questionable language uh, in the recording, although I do believe he would maybe lash out at the producers in that scene, but that's pretty much it. Uh, next scene, him separating from his wife, him staying with his brother, him at the court case. I can see a little bit of language here and there, but nothing too crazy. When he's looking for jobs, you know, oh, here's my impression of a hot dog. See, that's another perfect opportunity for him to go crazy, but keep in mind, he has to kind of be on some good behavior because he's kind of looking for work here. So I can't see him getting too raw there. Next scene is him calling for the job where he does all the different voices to his wife. There's got to be a very fine line here because you got to do what's best for the story also. And there's a fine line between a coming off as believable and being a straight up jerky boy sketch. So Maybe for one or two of the voices he would have, but I can't see him going all out here. Him getting made up uh, with his brother and his brother's partner. Definitely here. If there's one scene in the movie, I can definitely see it happening. It's this one right here. And especially the scene where the three of them are looking at the camera. This is a perfect scene of the movie. And this is one that I definitely believe that was all ad-libbed in. The scene in the apartment with the social worker where he like, you know, puts his face in the kid. Oh, hello! I I can see him going there, but the thing is, keep in mind, she's a social worker. He has to be on his best behavior there because she's the one deciding whether or not he gets to, you know, keep visitation with his kids. So I don't know if, you know, he would go all out there. The montage, maybe a scene or two there. Um, but keep in mind, that's like maybe five or ten seconds. The bus. I can see him maybe doing something there as Mrs. Doubtfire, but maybe he'd have to keep it straight, otherwise his cover would be blown. Playing with the dinosaur props in front of the camera. Definitely there, I can definitely see him going crazy there, but keep in mind, he would have to, you know, be sort of on his best, best behavior, seeing as the owner of the network's there also. The dinner. Now, keep in mind, half the half the dinner is him with the, um, with his family, which includes the kids, and the other half is with the boss. Now, he has to be on his best behavior for both one, so I can't see him getting too raunchy with either either group. But in the scene or two when he's in the kitchen, I can see him bending the rules there a little bit. Now, that's ten scenes where Williams would have had to go so bad that the movie would have blown right past R, right into NC-17 territory. And even in most of those scenes, it, it wouldn't have made sense. Now, I'm going to give you an example of two other movies. Released a decade before Mrs. Doubtfire was the Al Pacino crime drama Scarface. Now this movie is known for its rampant drug use, a little bit of nudity, violence, and the biggest one of all, language. The F-bomb has been said to be in the movie anywhere from 182 to 226 times. The next movie, 
was released a full two decades later, and that is The Wolf of Wall Street. Now, violence wasn't that bad in this movie, but there was still nudity and drug use. Also, language in this film? 687 no-no words, 506 of them being the F-bomb. These movies had to be trimmed so much to get at least an R rating. They were in full NC-17 territory, so are we to believe that Williams' ad-libbing was so much and so bad that it was worse than both of these movies? Okay, so going by language alone, uh, I'd say I'd give about 10 scenes. There'd have to be an average of 68.7 swears per scene. Or F-bombs alone would be 50 per scene. Seeing as many of these scenes are less than 5 minutes, that comes down to 6 F-bombs per second. And I mean, that's not to say Williams wouldn't try his hardest if that was his goal. Think of a movie as a salad. And violence, language, so-and-so are the toppings. I refuse to believe that there's an NC-17 cut of this movie based off of language alone. Because keep in mind, it's not everyone ad-libbing. It's not rewrites to the script. It's just Robin Williams ad-libbing and doing his thing. So there would not only have to be a perfect storm of him ad-libbing bad language, but also violence, nudity, drug use. And even then, it would have to take up the whole movie, not just the 10 scenes I just listed. Those scenes take up maybe a half hour or less of the film. And before you know it, you're staring at a plate to where there was once lettuce is just a pile of bacon bits, croutons, and Thousand Island. It sh still is technically a salad, but it is far from the uh, director's vision. In the 2000s and rise of DVD, many films came out with a version you couldn't see in theaters or unrated. This worked for films such as Superbad, Knocked Up, Wedding Crashers, and so on. These weren't NC-17 bad. They were just, we didn't submit these versions to the MPAA. So if you see unrated, it doesn't mean that they're more wild. Heck, some animated movies even have deleted scenes and the disclaimer that they aren't rated. See, with films like that, Unrated works for films like that because, you know, Superbad, Knocked Up, The Hangover, and so on. Those are movies that, like, are raunchy comedies. It works for those movies. You know what movie I don't believe it would work for? A movie about a separated dad who goes to extreme lengths to get visitation with his children. Are you ready for a truth bomb? In May of 2021, Christopher Columbus stated that there was no NC-17 version of the movie. But there was footage that would get the movie an R rating. But he has stated that there will never be an R-rated version released. If that footage were to ever see the light of day, it would most likely be in a documentary. Is it possible that Chris Columbus was just spouting how crazy the ad libbing was? Maybe. Maybe he just wanted to say how it was working with Williams. Since what he said in that Yahoo article wasn't in quotes, he may have been misquoted or he may have just been joking around. Or he might have just been saying things because this that interview was less than a year after Williams had passed, so he might have just been given memories of a dear friend. In regards to an R rating, do I believe if that footage is ever released, will we see a Frankenstein fan edit of it? Oh, most definitely. Do I believe it'll add anything to the movie besides laughs? No. Do I believe it'll tarnish Williams' legacy? Also no. Do I believe it'll be hilarious? Yes. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for watching, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm Kept seeing that tweet going around and my friend Darrell posted it and I was like, it's kind of hard to get an NC-17 rating on improv alone. So I thought I would do this. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I shed some truth. If uh, anyone posts that, feel free to post this video. Maybe I'll make a short out of it so they don't have to watch a 15 to 20 minute video. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you so much for watching. At the time of making this, I'm at about 480 subs. So I'm almost to 500. I'm going to have to do something special for 500. And uh, be sure to like and subscribe, comment below, comment with your favorite Williams movie, your favorite Williams memory. Do you like Mrs. Doubtfire? But what your favorite scene is in there. I, I'm a fan of uh, pretty much anything with Pierce Brosnan. He was so cool in the movie. And that's where I first experienced him. So I uh, thank you for watching and I will see you soon. Peace.